All right, here we go. We are recording. So tonight we're talking about George Lefty Tyler. And uh, one of the reasons we were going to talk about George is obviously there's, it's fun to track one person's life in genealogy, like to try to create a narrative from birth to death by looking at a, a ton of different resources. And so whenever we look at one person, we can do that. We can say, what else should we look at that will tell us about this person's life? But why Lefty? Well, Lefty was from Derry, and one of his uh, his portraits is here in the New Hampshire room. It's over my right shoulder here. And recently, I was writing up biographies, uh, little biographies for each portrait in the New Hampshire room, and I, I realized I didn't know that much about Lefty. And so I started looking into his life story. You know, looking first in the, in the Derry News and. Um, into some other genealogical resources. And I found that there was, first of all, a lot of information on him. And secondly, that it was pretty fascinating. So I'm just gonna tell you what I know based on the research that I was able to do. You can see pictures of Lefty here. These are from the Library of Congress archive. Um, but with any uh, life story, we're gonna start at the beginning. So let's start with family. And this is where we'll see a bit of dairy. Uh, we actually see a lot of dairy in this. So on your left, you can see here his birth certificate. Uh, this is George Lefty Tyler's birth certificate. He was born December 14th, 1889, to John Tyler and Martha J. McCannon here in Derry. His father was a shoe worker. His mother held no formal occupation. Probably, I thought, because she was looking after her sons. And George was one, he was the second of four boys. So she certainly would have been busy with that. And, uh, and they were right here in Derry. So if we look at an old map, and I love old maps, um, but whenever you're dealing with finding a house on an old map, you really have to try to figure out which one you're gonna use for that time period. And it can be tricky. So we have a great 1898 map in our, in our map case, but it doesn't really give you street names necessarily. And then the Sanborn fire map that we're looking at here isn't till 1921. However, it does give us uh, street numbers. So if you can see right here at South Ave, so this is where he, he was living. And, um, oops, sorry, I popped right out of that. My Prezi is like bouncing around a little bit. Uh, according to the city directory, when he was with his parents, they were at 46 South Avenue, where, where John, um, that was where John was recorded as living, and that would have been 1904. So he may have been at different addresses at different parts of his life, but for a couple of different points that I looked at with city directories and maps, it was uh, 46 South Avenue. So that would have been within walking distance of Colburn Fuller Shoe Factory. Also, that one was also on South Avenue. Um, the Pillsbury Shoe Factory was up on West Broadway. I mentioned those two shoe factories because his dad would have been, I don't know which one he was at, but it would have been one of them. Um, he would have been able to hear the Boston and Maine coming up the track to the Dairy Depot. And he played ball at the Dairy Athletic Association ball field. I think that was where it is now, isn't it? Down yes. Now? Yep. On Railroad Ave. Yes. Yeah. The locker room is over there. Old okay interesting i don't know if you guys can hear al but he was saying the locker room was over santander uh bank it would have been at the top of that building yes. yeah that was a shower room they used to dress up and shower and, and then, then walk, walk down, down interesting yep so you know it's west dairy everything within walking distance uh of the times and and that's where he was that's where he grew up so uh the whole family was involved and invested in baseball, it seemed. This was their thing. I'm going to go uh, give you little bits about each one, but I couldn't delve into every single brother's career in detail because they really were in the Dairy News as much sometimes as George was. I mean, George definitely was shining. He was like the star. <laughs> but James Arthur, you'll see, was mentioned all the time. So was Fred. So was Bill. Um, so here's the list of the brothers. James Arthur Tyler, he was, he was the oldest. He was born in 1887. Then there was George, 1889. Fred Clancy Tyler, um, who Rick talked about in the Dairy News, uh, it was a rerun, but you can look at that article from last week, 1891. And then William Bill Tyler was born in 1895. 
and they all play ball here in dairy and beyond. So a quick glimpse at what footage we see in the dairy news or coverage rather. Um, I love this one because it shows both James and George and has a little article about both of them. They were here, this was a Dairy Athletic Association news articles. Uh, it said George was a strong pitcher from the start, uh, um, but James Arthur was always talked about as being like the best batter. Um, so at this point in time, these pictures you're seeing, George right here would have been 17 and James Arthur about 19. And it's it talks about um, how even in this one, how G uh, George's um, pitching was great and how James was the best batter. You can see it right up here in the in the headlines. Lawrence boys found themselves up against the real thing. A Tyler, star at bat, heavy hitting also by Corson and Stokes and superb pitching by G Tyler. That was one of the first articles I ran into. That was 1907. Here's a picture of Frederick Clancy Tyler. This is from just from Wik the picture from Wikipedia. Um, but I learned from Rick that Fred met some success in the minor leagues and then joined the Boston Braves. Uh, it sounded like it was a pawn lefty suggestion to the coach midway through the season um, of their Miracle Braves year, which was 1914. And the idea was that they needed relief for some of the catchers. So Fred ended up playing for the National League during that same season. And I think that's pretty fascinating that Derry was such a small town and these two brothers who obviously were very close, which you'll see in a couple of things later, um, both played uh, during that, that season. And then William was a baby of the family, many years younger than George, but he also was a strong pitcher. He played for Pinkerton and then the Dairy Athletic Association. There was a lot of coverage of Bill. And one that I found particularly amazing, and you'll notice this here in the Dairy News, this is how they often showed um, the, the baseball coverage in the Dairy News of the time. So you'll see like a brief summary and then the statistics of the game. But sometimes they do like the play-by-play -play and it was really interesting. In this particular one, you'll see that they're saying um, a feature of the contest of this particular game was an unusual occurrence. Four Tyler brothers, sons of John F. Tyler, played in the game. Three played in the Dairy Athletic Association team and one with the Pinkertons. Must have been Bill because he would have been the youngest. Yeah. So all, yeah, all three of the uh, other ones would have been with the Dairy Athletic Association. Sounds like they were the ones who won that game, but all four of the Tyler brothers were there. And as you might notice with the Dairy News here, they really know the Tyler family. And they, you, you start to see sort of an affection for them as you continue to read through the dairy news. So old newspapers obviously are rich, awesome resources. Um, here's one picture of the Dairy Athletic Association uh, team. This is uh, in Images of America Dairy. I love the Images of America series. I don't know if you guys know them. I, I bet you do. Um, there's, there's something on like every town. And you just get pictures and a brief description and pictures and a brief description. They're not great with an index. So you can't really necessarily search for George Lefty Tyler, but I knew he was in there. So I went searching anyway. Uh, it's just really nice uh, to be able to take a look. So this was their 1907, 1908 team. Um, there's George down in the corner there. It only mentions him in the description on the bottom. I don't know if the other brothers are in there because I don't know exactly, like I can't tell you know, between the newspaper versus this if I'm looking at one of them, because it's hard to tell based on a newspaper, but that was their gear. You think one of them's in there? Which one do you think's in there? Which one do you think it would be? I think there's a family resemblance. Because it would have been, <laughs> I don't know if they pitched at the same time though. Well, my dad was younger, so he would have been in the Derry Million later on. Oh. My dad was born in 1904. Okay. So Al has a couple of pictures, which I think we'll look at toward the end, see if we can identify any of the brothers. Because um, I can't, again, it just says, Lord, uh, you know, George Lefty Tyler, bottom row, far right. What I like about this kind of thing when we look, and I love that dog is just sleeping on George's foot. That's pretty adorable. <laughs> so 
What I love about this kind of thing is you can look at the info that the historical people are giving you and then kind of go to the dairy news for the same year and say, okay, what was happening that year? Can we get any info about any of the games this exact team would have been playing? You get faces and then you get stories about what they were up to. And so that's what I did here with just a little snippet from the dairy news. And we see that um, it says, as forecasted by the enterprise last week, the article of ball put up by the DAA team against the Shamrocks of Haverhill Mass was of vastly superior character to that exhibited by the members of the team the previous week. And although they made numerous errors, only one counted to their disadvantage. And that one allowed the visitors their sole run. So this backs up what the historians are saying about it. This is a great year for them. You know, this is talking about a great game. Um, it says A. Tyler excelled in the batting list. No surprise, we saw that before. And George Tyler fooled the Shoe City boys and Fred Tyler quickly showed them it was useless to attempt to steal second base. The game in detail, and then they would have gone on to tell more. So um, that you start to correlate between two different, uh-oh. Can you guys hear me? Okay. It's saying low system resources may affect your audio quality. So tell me if you can't hear me, okay? Everything's fine, Aaron. Okay, good. Uh, before we dive into uh, George's career, we do just want to talk about, you know, marriage, kids, the life stuff that was happening at the time. So George Ty Tyler had married Lillian McCarthy on the 29th of January, 1913. He would have been 23 years old. Um, the wedding was in Lowell. And at that point, George had already begun his professional baseball career. Uh, you can see, if you look at the marriage register down here, it says George A. Tyler, they're on the first line, Lowell, professional ball player. And then it says Catherine L. McCarthy, but later we see her in census records, that's Lillian. So we know that, you know, that's the same person. And also it helps us over here in the article about their wedding. And I always love old newspapers because they give the details about the weddings. They don't do that so much anymore, but you can get a glimpse of the family life. Um, it says George A. Tyler of this town, famous baseball player, a son of Mr. and Mrs. John F. Tyler was united in marriage on Wednesday with Miss Lillian McCarthy of Lowell, Mass in the city. The bride is the daughter of Mrs. John McCarthy and her home has been in Lowell for several years. The ceremony was performed in the rectory of the Sacred Heart Church. And then it also says that might be of interest to you um, down here, Fred H. Tyler, a brother of the bridegroom was best man. So <clears throat> We know that Fred was the best man in George's wedding, which I think is interesting. And then they played ball together later. Um, and it does say at the very bottom here, they left Wednesday night on a trip to New York and Washington. Mrs. Tyler will not accompany her husband on the spring uh, training trip of the Boston National League Club. So we know he's in the Boston National League at that time. I couldn't go in detail into the children's life, but I do want to mention them here. Uh, George Albert Tyler Jr. was born on the 29th of January, 1916. And then Esther Jean Tyler, was born on the 29th of June, 1917. So let's look a little bit at, at Lefty's career. He began, uh, obviously, as you know, with the Dairy Athletic Association, and then he was a pro pitcher from 1910 to 1921. He played for the New England League in Lowell in 1909 and was with the Boston Nationals by 1910. And then, of course, the big like culminating moment was uh, he was part of the Miracle Braves in 1914. He was part of the pitching rotation and then traded to the Chicago Cubs in 1918. And then uh, he closed out his major league career in 1921. During all of his professional career, he was reported in the Dairy News. Like they loved him so much. So I'm gonna show a couple of glimpses of just what Dairy was talking about when, when George was out there. So I liked this one. <clears throat> he was 19, this is just like early, right? So uh, it says he won Friday's game from New England League team four to three. They were playing, so, so George came back to play against the Dairy Athletic Association when he was on the Lowell team at the New England League. And so it says in the Dairy News, uh, which was the Dairy Enterprise actually, a, ple a pleasing feature of the game occurred when George Tyler came to bat in the third inning, the appearance of this popular young twirler in a major league uniform in his hometown had given his many admirers the out. Hence an agreeable surprise was pl uh, planned for him and when he stepped up to the home plate, umpire Lawson, who obviously he would have known, um, presented him a dress suitcase and a ring to which he responded in a fitting manner. 
So I think that's just such a nice story. Like he came home to play against the Dairy Athletic Association team and he was presented with a gift when he came up to bat. Um, that's pretty, pretty great. And then this one I loved, again, Dairy Enterprise 1911. Uh, they say Derry's wonderful baseball player making his mark with the Boston Nationals. Uh, he's called, you know, cool as a cucumber. I, I just love the language they're using here at the bottom. It says, on the other hand, George Tyler had the Orioles eating out of his hand before hits were all he let out. And at, uh, at that, two of them should have been out. The youngster was as cool as a cucumber. Once or twice, he appeared to be losing control, but immediately settled down and was as tight as a clam. Uh, he had everything in the book and sent several of the Orioles down by the air. Is that airline? Is that what that would have been? I, I'm not sure because I can't tell if it says air cue or airline. And I don't know enough about baseball terminology to be able to tell you. But um, obviously, then down here, it uh, again talks about the little boy pitching himself onto easy street. So I just, I think, you know, they loved him um, in Derry. So they're talking about how great he is at the Boston Nationals. And then obviously the Miracle Braves comes up. Um, the Miracle Braves story, I want, I want you to just hear a little of this from the, the Kirby's Augusta, because I really liked this clip because it kind of gives you a sense of the season. And it doesn't really focus that much on lefty, but why they're called the Miracle Braves comes up. Also, it tells you a little bit about um, kind of the culture they would have been experiencing at the time. So I'm gonna just play this clip and I want to make sure you guys can hear it. So I'm gonna share my, hopefully my computer audio. But tell me if you can't hear it, okay? In 1914, the Braves, yes, the Braves, did something in baseball that no team had done before nor has done since. With a flurry of victories, they went from last place in July to first place in September. And then they went to the World Series and defeated the best team in baseball at that time, the Philadelphia Athletics, four games to nothing. They called it a miracle. They were dubbed the Miracle Braves and their manager, George Tweedy Stallings, was the toast of the baseball world. Back in Augusta, he was proclaimed a hometown boy who had made very, very good. Man for man, we weren't a great team, recalled pitcher Bill James, who won 19 games and lost only one. We were an eighth place team, and without Stallings, we would have stayed there. An Augusta native born two years after the Civil War, Stallings was known by several names. Reporters referred to him as Gentleman George. His players called him Big Daddy or Chief. His opponents called him the meanest man in Boston. Stallings could be a gruff manager. Once in the minors, he went out to the mound to relieve a young pitcher who'd just given up six straight walks. He told him not only to get out of the game, but maybe consider burning his uniform. A few moments later, smoke could be seen coming from the clubhouse. And Stallings sent someone in to get that bonehead out of there. The uniform was saved. The pitcher went elsewhere. Stallings also was ahead of his time in sports psychology, and he played the media well. According to one story, Stallings had several reporters over before the start of that 1914 World Series. He made a great show of picking up the telephone and, as they watched, calling Philadelphia manager Connie Mack to ask if the Braves could practice at his field before the game. Mack politely told Stallings that his own team would be using the field, but offered to see what he could do. Stallings exploded, and as the reporters scribbled hastily, berated his rival for the lack of respect given the Braves. The next day, headlines further angered his players, who went out and whipped the American League champs in four quick games. Few knew the truth that Stallings had already made arrangements to practice at another field before his phone call. 
After the World Series, Stallings came home to Augusta to a hero's welcome. He was greeted at the Union train station by many of his old Richmond Academy classmates and teammates that he once played with on this field here at the old Richmond Academy. He then had a banquet at the Plaza Hotel. Augusta's other baseball standout, Ty Cobb, the league batting champ, sat with him. It must have been quite an affair, as the Chronicle reported, the addresses were snappy, the Toastmaster was successful in keeping the liveliest interest, the vocal music was apt and catchy, the instrumental music fine, the menu all right, the service excellent, and the company in magnificent spirits. Adjournment was had at a late hour. 1914 was the last time Stallings won a championship, but after that miracle season, he probably didn't need another one. I thought that was great because it gives you the idea. You understand that they started at very last and then they came up to first. And Stallings, pretty tough, uh, you know, coach, right? So that's that's tricky <laughs> to work with, but. George would have known him, and I think that's really fascinating. Gives you a little glimpse of the culture that he was part of uh, playing baseball, and Fred would have known him too. So at, in 1918, um, George got traded to the Cubs. So this is a little picture from one of our lateral files that I found when I was digging around for information on him, and I thought that was a nice picture of him in the Cubs uniform. So this is just coverage in uh, 1918 from the dispatch in Moline, Illinois. And it says Boston Southpaw secured for catcher uh, for catcher Wilson and Doyle, also cash. So the Cubs annex Tyler. So he goes to the to the Cubs for a few years, but for not a long time because you know there's a time limit limit. There was a time limit on his arm, um, but he had a good run with the Chicago Cubs. It, it seemed like he had many many great games, and he was doing wonderfully. But 1919 rolls around pretty soon and his arm starts to irritate him. And then you start to see the news change where he starts to be um, in the hospital or they say he's, you know, he's burned his arm out. So I'm just going to show you a couple of different um, pieces of new news coverage. And yes, you're reading that right. That says bad teeth, sore arm. Basically what happened was his arm was causing him trouble. Uh, leading up to the 1919 season, then he was hospitalized and he was diagnosed with neuritis. Um, but then, and I don't know if it was related to neuritis or if they'd researched this further, but they believed uh, the problem emanated from his bad teeth. So they pulled them. Um, and I'm going to show you the different articles and I don't know how many teeth were pulled, but it said wholesale. So I'm assuming they pulled several teeth. So here's 1919. We start to see the coverage. It says Tyler Cub hurler, uh, maybe forced to pit baseball. So Boston Mass, July 17th, George Lefty Tyler, Cub hurler, maybe forced to retire from baseball. The one-time star left-hander of the Braves has been ailing for the greater part of the present season, and it was learned today that he's suffering with neuritis. Tyler starred for the Braves when they won the pennant and the World Series in 1914. So um, that would have been July. Now, by November, we get this next article, which is Tyler in Hospital. It says, November 14th, a new method of treatment of a ball player is to be tried in the case of George Lefty Tyler of the Chicago Cubs. Uh, the pitcher accompanied by Secretary John Osays of the Cubs has arrived here to take a series of treatments at the Mayo Brothers Hospital for a sore arm. And if there's any chance to bring him back to form, the cure of the institution here is expected to do so. So, I mean, you have a young guy. I mean, he's at this point not even 30. Yeah, he's not even 30 and his arms burned out and they're trying everything they can to help and make sure it can, he can keep going. This is what he does. Baseball is what he does. And then um, this one was, which year was the, I think it was just later in that. No, it was by the 8th of October, 1920, he had a little revival. So it said grade eight for left-hander. George Tyler apparently has regained winning form since wholesale extraction of teeth. According to the dentist who yanked all George Tyler's teeth, his wholesale extraction will be a great thing for the left-hander, and the statement seems to be true. Look at lefties one and lost percent. But you don't see Jim Vaughn, Slim Sally, Rube Benton, or Artie Neff, and, uh, and other Southpaw, uh, Southpaws making a mad rush to have the ivory torn from the deeply bedded concrete. 
So yeah, they pulled his teeth and, and maybe there was for a while it worked well, but by 1921, he was not in the major leagues anymore. So um, I, it couldn't have done too much for him. Now that doesn't mean he didn't play ball, right? He kept playing ball. Sorry, I'm trying to get myself to the next slide. So after that, you know, we find him in different places. We still are looking, I look through the census records and the more local newspapers to Lowell again. Um, so by age 31, George had pretty much completed his professional baseball clear, uh, career. He'd lost many teeth, obviously. He'd returned home to Lowell and played in the minor leagues in the local divisions after that. So you'll see over here, they have a little write up uh, in 1922. George Tyler, formerly of the Boston Braves, will twirl for Centerville All-Stars tomorrow afternoon against the Boston Post Office 9 at Lowell. So he's not in the major leagues, but he's still playing ball, which seems like something he, he loved forever and ever. And so at least he got a chance to, to still play. He was living on Varnum Ave uh, at that time, owned a house, and he worked as a cutter at the shoe shop. You can see right over here, the listing of their occupations. You got cutter, shoe shop, and supporting the family there. There I also are boarding somebody named Margaret Ro Robert, who worked at the shoe shop as a stitcher. Well, that's interesting. And then, you know, Lefty stayed in Lowell and that's what he did. So he, he continued to work. Um, I do wanna mention James Arthur Tyler here because when I was doing my report on Lefty, I did come across this. It was just really a big thing in, in George's life. It would have been a big moment. So I didn't wanna ignore it. Uh, on the 2nd of December, 1932, I still get choked up thinking about it because <laughs> it's local. Um, let me compose myself. So. Yeah, it's a shame. You can read it. <laughs> uh, James was found dead in the car on the Dairy Athletic Association ball field. Wow. And had apparently committed suicide. So he does rest in the Forest Hill Cemetery. He was here. He lived here. He was an insurance man. He had, he, you know, he hadn't, maybe, I don't know if he still played ball occasionally. But um, he was working and uh, you can read the coverage either when I send you the link or in the Dairy News yourself uh, if you're curious about the full coverage. But he was 45 years old. He'd been an insurance agent. He was living on Maple Street and they just found him. He'd driven out to the ball field and, and he shot himself. So they found him. They weren't sure if it was a suicide or a murder or something else had happened and it was a deemed a suicide. And, um, you know, this would have been a huge thing. Uh, George would have been by then in his 50s, same with, same with James. So if you're ever wandering around the Forest Hill Cemetery, you know, I do that from time to time. Of course, you know, I do that. I stop by his site if you think of it. Uh, the later life, we still find George uh, working and living on Varnum Ave. So he's living on Varnum Ave in Lowell. He was still a shoe cutter. And his life, uh, his wife, Lillian, who he was still with, worked as a vampire also in the shoe shop. And his son, George, worked as a clerk. Um, and daughter, Jean, worked as a hairdresser. I do believe George went into the military and had a pretty active military career and also was a prisoner of war at one time. That would have been after uh, George's passing. Um, as you can see here, <laughs> He was still, you know, his, his time in the spotlight was no, no small deal. And this is, you can see the Boston Sunday Globe from May 27th, 1951. And it says Lefty Tyler at Lowell Home recalls exploit of the 1914 Braves. And I love the beginning of this. I thought this was interesting. It says the reunion this week of the members of the 1914 Boston Braves Wonder Team will provide happy reminiscing the subject of many of the stories will be a quiet, unassuming white haired gentleman from Lowell, George A. Lefty Tyler. Um, so, you know, you've got this guy who's working in the shoe factory, living life in Lowell, and he's, you know, he and his son were looking over old photos here with their dog and uh, must have been a happy, happy moment there. George passed away suddenly on the 29th of September, 1953 at the age of 63. I didn't request his death record. Um, 
because I, I, I don't have a, <laughs> a personal account where I can spend a lot of money. But uh, he died on the anniversary of the big game when the Miracle Braves clinched the pennant in 1914. He died on this, the anniversary of that big day, which I think is fascinating. So baseball was all of George's life. He had humble beginnings. It's, he had humble endings. Uh, but his 15 minutes in the spotlight <laughs> was spectacular, it seems like. So uh, he was really, really interesting to look at. And if you want to find out more about him, which I I could go on and on or look into the brothers a little bit more. You can do that. So you'll notice we looked at the dairy news and of course, you know, census records, marriage records, death information, although I don't have this death certificate, but uh, we do have info on George in the lateral file in here in the New Hampshire realm. So there's some clippings, some pictures of him, um, just, just some stats if you're interested in the stats. The Dairy Museum of History does have a little bit on display of George and I think Greta, and they have a, a cup from Tyler Day, which is, I, I think a bunch of dairy people went down to see George play. So they, there was like a big trip to go down and see George play and it was a big deal. Um, a lot of loyalty to this, this hometown hero. The Dairy News archives, you know, are online. So you can go in there and look up any of the brothers' names. Um, using quotation marks with the, to get the exact phrase and it'll pull up their name. There's tons of coverage because they talked about the sports each week, right? So you're gonna see more than you can digest on George because it's just week to week. There's George, there's George, George for dec a couple of decades. Um, so there's tons to discover there. And then the, the article I was referring to that they re-ran in last week's Dairy News was Hometown Baseball Brothers Remembered by Rick Holmes. And this is the link to the article if you're interested in that as well. So now I'm gonna stop the recording and we can go ahead and open up to questions or, or dig around more if anybody's interested. And I, I know Al has some pictures of the Dairy Athletic Association because his dad was on um, that team as well. So let me stop the recording.